tailor a contract like you are at a Ford. This is not going to be for a small amount of money. It's going to be for a large amount of money. Um, so in other words, what, what Fords tend to be is uh, um, a market such that we might have Boeing. Uh, and then we might have Toyota. So Toyota sells a lot of cars in the U.S. They need to take U.S. dollars and bring them back to Japan. Uh, so they're converting dollars into yen. Uh, Boeing sells airplanes in Japan. They get a lot of yen for it, and they have to turn around and convert them into dollars. So what we have is a, a market where we have a bank. This is, um, uh, what do we say, interbank market? This is a bank making a market. There, um, we have a, a market where, where banks try to match very... Uh, very large corporations who need to trans, you know, uh, to uh, um, convert large sums of money. So this is sort of what the forward market looks like. Uh, um, so you know, the idea here is Toyota is sending dollars and Boeing is sending yen, and the bank matches these two. And of course, the bank does a lot of things. Maybe uh, Boeing, you know, Toyota only wants to convert 200 million, uh, but Boeing wants the equivalent of 200. Uh, 250 million, then the bank may internalize and, and, and match these two. So, you know, may take on the other side of this for 50 million so to match the trade. So the bank does a lot here. Of course, the bank is going to earn a bid ask spread. We'll talk about the bid ask spread. Um, but the thing to get here is in a Ford, um, it only makes sense to tailor contracts if, they, if they're large. The other thing is because it is only a trade, um, all the bank is doing is matching Boeing and, and and Toyota, there's there's counterparty risk. So theoretically, if Toyota defaults, um, then you know Boeing wouldn't get its money. So the idea here is there's 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 um, there's counterparty risk in this trade. So in general, people only trade if, if they're you know confident in, in, in the other counterparty. So e e there's no chance of Toyota defaulting. There's no chance of Boeing defaulting. So or very little chance. So um, they're natural players in the, in the forward market. Uh, however, once we have players that aren't this big, um, aren't you know, extremely large, uh, very well-known multinational corporations, one thing comes out here is um, it doesn't. One thing is counterparty risk. So if this is me or you or some small company, then then uh, all of a sudden counterparty risk becomes a very real thing. Also, uh, it doesn't make sense to 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 tailor contracts to much small amounts. So what we have. Once I say we trade on an exchange, like the, the CME, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, we could have something like me, uh, you, and in between us, we have a clearing corporation. So what the clearing corporation does is when I, you know, let's say you, uh, you're buying yen um, and selling dollars, and I'm uh, selling yen and buying dollars, um, so yen flows through here, yen flows through here. The idea is a clearing corporation sits in the middle and, in fact, I'm transacting with the clearing corporation and you're transacting with the clearing corporation. So the clearing corporation is going to guarantee all trades. So in other words, um, theoretically, I shouldn't worry about any sort of counterparty risk. The mechanism, of course, that the clearing corporation uses to guarantee trades, of course, the clearing corporation isn't going to say, well, I'll, I'll, I'll you know, I'll, uh, don't worry about it, I've got this covered. Uh, they're obviously going to protect themselves, so what they require is margin. Uh, the CME, I think, calls it now a performance bond, but I, I, I'm just going to call it margin. Uh, so what the CME says is, you put up, um, you know, uh, each of you put up $5,000, and uh, if, you, if, if, you know, whoever makes, um, if, if I make $100 today, then $100 is transferred or, uh, um, from you to me. I now have $5,100. You have uh, $4,900. Uh, so it's mark to market and settled every day. Ca uh, gains and losses are realized every day. And what happens is if you lose such amount that your margin drops to maybe $1,000, um, the clearing corporation will say, add in more margin or I'll close out your trade. So they will always close out your trade before um, you lose more than you, than you can cover. So by requiring margin, um, the clearing, you know, we, we, we reduce or, or nearly eliminate counterparty risk in, uh, uh, when we're trading on an exchange. So this naturally lends itself to a lot of companies trade on exchange, large corporations. Um, but it naturally lends itself also to smaller players, which means we can really increase the liquidity, the amount of trading in a futures market as opposed to a forward market. It's the futures is standardized, no counterparty risk, so uh, there's a great deal more trading. Um, the only other thing I want to say, uh, so um, what this means for pricing. 
uh, is uh, futures and forwards may have a very you know if, if I'm looking at pricing futures as opposed to forwards, uh, the main difference um, is you know time value of money. So if I get rid of counterparty risk, then uh, futures are a little bit different because I have to put up money up front. Whereas in a forward contract, it's just an agreement. No money is 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 uh, uh, is exchanges hands up front. So there's a little bit of difference in the pricing between futures and forwards when it comes to less counterparty risk and but time value of money. I have to put money up here and I have to put don't have to put money there. Uh, for all uh, for all purposes in general here, you know, uh, you could get an exam question where I say ignore the time value of money and counterparty risk. This is the price of the forward. This is the price of the futures, and they should be the same uh, if it's for delivery on the same date. Um, so in general, forwards and futures prices should be very very similar. Uh, is there anything else here I want to say about futures? Um, yes, yes, I do. Uh, bid ask spread, non deliverable futures, and uh, the futures risk premium. Uh, I mean, the future premium. Good. So, one thing to think about, and this is going to, uh, now this, in general, going forward in the class, I'm going to sort of use the term forward and futures interchangeably, um, even though, of course, there are these distinctions that we've just said. But now the idea here is, whenever you trade, whether it's, it's forwards or futures, ultimately you, you run into a bid-ask spread. So if I'm actually going to, to buy a futures contract, I'm going to bring up my account and I'm going to see something like this. Uh, the bid is going to be, let's say, $2 per pound, and the ask is going to be $2.02 .02 per pound. So what this says is, if I want to buy the pound, for every pound I buy, it's going to cost $2.02. .02. If I want to sell a pound, I will receive, for every pound I sell, $2. Of course, you're always going to buy it for more than you sell it. The, 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 the entity posting these quotes is the market maker. So, of course, the market maker um, earns money by, by, uh, by you know, of course, uh, selling here and buying here uh, and earns the spread. It doesn't, the market maker just wants to sell here and buy here as many times as it can and earn that spread. Uh, so, the idea here is what's going to, so these are directly, when, you, when we talk about a bid ask, uh, the difference between these two is the bid ask spread. When we talk about a, a bid ask spread in these markets, that's a direct measure of transaction cost. So this is the larger the bid ask spread, the larger my transaction cost for trading in this market. Uh, so the question is what affects this bid ask spread for what, for what um, under what uh, characteristics broadly, uh, will kind of narrow that spread or, or widen it. And the idea here is, one thing to think about, there's some factors, there's the cost of, of holding an inventory, so generally higher interest rates and so forth. Uh, if there's really high interest rate on the pound and I have to hold an inventory in pounds to make a market here, uh, um, you know, it'll generally increase my cost and increase the bid ask spread. But, of course, competition, there, there can be many market makers here and that's gonna push, that's gonna narrow the spread. Uh, but the idea of, of when, you know, for what we need to know in managing a multinational corporation is, uh, in general, what the market maker wants to do is it doesn't want to hold an inventory. It just wants to sell here and buy here. So this spread can be narrower the more trading there is. The more likely it is for, for the market maker to say, if I buy here, it'll be easy to turn around and sell it there. If I buy here and it's really hard to turn around and sell it, then that adds risk. That means I have to hold an inventory. If I'm holding an inventory, if I bought a pound here without the ability to sell it, I own one pound. Of course, then something in the market can change that can change the value of the pound. So I don't necessarily want to hold an inventory. I want to be able to sell it quickly. What dictates the ease in which I can sell it, of course, is the amount of trading in the market. The, what, caught, what, what determines the amount of trading ultimately Again, these markets exist for the for really the purpose of, uh, of um, hedging uh, for multinational corporations. So the amount of trade and investment between two uh, countries will dictate the amount of trading in the foreign exchange market. Which will uh, the more the more investment and uh, importing and exporting between two countries will generally tend to narrow the bid ask spread. So we see very narrow bid ask spreads between. Uh, U.S. and Japan, U.S. and England, U.S. and uh, Europe, U.S. and Canada, because there's a lot of trade in between. Um, if there's not a lot of trade, then there's not a lot of transactions. It's very risky for a market maker, and the bid ask spread tends to be wider. So that's one. Um, the amount of trade dictates the size of the spread. Uh, so if you're transacting in, you know, if I have to hedge a currency, and we, there's not a lot of trading going on, I know my transaction costs will be higher. One other thing to keep in mind is. 
this is dictated by again uh, the hedging by large multi, you know, by by uh, uh, by uh, people who trade among these two countries or people who invest among these two countries. So the my uh, desire to hedge is a function of how certain I am about the cash flow. So in other words. Um, over the next couple months, I really know if, if I'm going to have to, uh, if I'm going to receive money, if I'm, if I'm selling, if I'm Apple, if I'm selling computers uh, in Europe, over the next couple months, I may have a fairly decent idea of what my, how many euros I'll get. So then I can hedge them. However, once we go out you know, past a year, maybe two years, the amount uh, that I'm going to sell in Europe, and therefore, and that the price at which I can sell it, and therefore the cash flows that I'm going to receive in Europe will become much less certain. And if they're much less certain, I naturally uh, don't have, I, I can't hedge them because I don't know how much to hedge. So uh, what's going to happen here is, is um, corporations don't hedge uh, farther and farther out. So there's less and less hedging as we go farther and farther out. So really, past six months, and particularly a year, um, there's, there's, very, there's very little trading. There's very little corporations I want to hedge after, you know, out past a year. So the bid-ash spread tends to be wider. So you can think of the transaction cost for um, for this hedging uh, is going to be dictated by uh, the time to maturity. The, the 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 larger you know the farther we go out, the larger the bid ask spread and the amount of trading um, uh, you know the amount of trade between these two countries and investment. Good. So that's the bid ask spread. The last thing I'll say, if not really the last thing I'll say about uh, about Ford's and futures, but the last thing I'll say uh, before we move on to, we've got non-deliverable forward contracts. Uh, and then I want to talk a little bit about how non-deliverable forwards are sort of informative into uh, maybe the recent financial crisis. Uh, not currency trading, but how similar contracts were used in mortgages. Um, and and then, then get into options. But what I want to say is uh, uh, the way we often quote uh, forward prices uh, for a currency is we talk about in terms of a forward premium. So we can say the forward rate is equal to spot price plus one plus the premium. We're just defining this. We have a spot rate and a forward rate. We're just saying, um, you know, the forward rate is a spot rate times some premium. Uh, and the idea here is, let's say, you know, the spot rate for the British pound is uh, $2 per pound, and the forward rate for the British pound is $2.10 per pound. Then uh, we have a forward, of course, this uh, implies a forward premium, uh, uh, forward uh, divided by spot minus one is 5%. And we would say the British pound is trading at a 5% premium. And to be clear, let's just say this is the forward rate in one year. So this is the uh, forward rate one year, because the forward premium is going to be annualized. So if this was a six month forward premium, I'd have to multiply it by two. Um, so, but we, so just so I can quote an annualized premium. So we would say the Ford, uh, um, the, the British pound is trading at a 5% premium. And what we're going to talk about in, in future chapters is that uh, the premium on a currency is, is, is intimately linked, is simply a function of uh, the interest rate differential between these two countries. So broadly, generally, what I can say is if, if the British pound is trading at a 5% premium, that means U.S. interest rates are 5% higher than British interest rates. Uh, again, we'll, we'll see this later with interest rate parity. But the... the the reason why we might quote, or we, reason why it's very common to quote uh, the forward rate, not in terms of this is what the forward rate, not saying the forward rate is $2.10, but rather saying the British pound trades at a 5% at a premium, is that this is going to be um, constant over time. So in other words, if this is a, uh, if, if the, the annual premium is 5%, then if I look at a forward out, um, six months, then it's going to trade at a 2.5% a premium to spot, right? uh, uh, and so forth. So the idea of uh, when we look at something like this is the forward rate, um, uh, this is the maturity. So this is you know one month, two month, three month. The idea here is if, if, this, if the spot rate is two dollars, uh, then it's going to be some linear function. And this is why we can quote it like a premium. Um, this is different than other markets. So in other words, I wouldn't necessarily do this in the natural gas market because if, if, if now is, is, is December in the natural gas market, then um, this curve is gonna look something like this because natural gas is, is much, you know, it has a, much, has a higher price because of a convenience yield um, in, in 
uh, January, February, March, and then it tends to have a lower price in summer. So I can't really say that, um, well, you know, I can't say that it's a 5% premium uh, out one year and, and have that dictate, well, how much is that out three months? It, it, um, uh, the convenient, it, it doesn't make any sense, it won't work. Um, however, simply because um, the, this premium is a function of interest rates, uh, we can, saying, uh, saying that there's an annual, the pound trades at 5%, tells me uh, ultimately uh, this entire curve. So all you have to, instead of saying this is the pound forward at one month, this is the uh, forward price at two months, and so forth, you can just tell me the annualized premium, I can, I can, I can fill the rest in. Hence, we tend to do that. Uh, talk about uh, annualized premium uh, on, on you know, uh, a, a premium or discount to spot, percentage-wise. Good. Next, we have to, we might talk about swaps real quick, and then we have to talk about non-deliverable forwards. Um, what I should do, however, is stop here real quick, uh, and then we'll pick up with non-deliverable forwards, um, because that's a, a fairly interesting topic uh, in and of itself.